wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome. It's Ken Reed here, your TV Guidance Counselor with the show TV Guidance Counselor. If you're checking out the show for the first time, thank you, welcome. Been doing this show about seven and a half years. I am an on-hiatus Boston comedian through no fault of my own. This was a global pandemic issue who's been uh, talking to people each and every week, haven't missed a week yet, we have over 500 episodes, about classic television using issues of TV Guide magazine from my personal collection as the gateway into our collective past. And for the last year, we've been doing the show remote. So someone picks a TV Guide. I throw it in my scanner, I send them a PDF, we do it virtually, we talk, and it's a great time. And this week's episode is no exception to that. If you are joining me for the first time because you're a fan of my guest, welcome. I think you'll enjoy this show. I certainly did. My guest this week is Dom Jolly, and Dom is just amazing. He, you, People in the States might know him from uh, Trigger Happy TV, which aired on Comedy Central here, but he's a travel writer. He's done so much cool stuff. He currently has a Twitch channel that a couple times a week he broadcasts, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, he talks about music and everything. It's just tune into that. It is, it is great, and uh, it kind of represents the best of where I think media is going, but that's a whole different conversation. Uh, but I, weirdly, and we didn't even bring this up, um, when I lived in the UK, Okay, I actually saw a couple tapings of Dom's talk show, which I think was called This Is Dom Jolly. And I got to see the Cure play and Suede, which was kind of cool because uh, he had that one musical guest. But anyway, uh, I wanted to talk to him for a long time. Always loved his stuff. Uh, and he has got a, a ton of books out as well. And if you're a podcast fan, there's podcast. There's a bunch of stuff on Audible. Just put Dom Jolly in Audible. He, the, the audio versions of his books are great. Uh, anyway, it was great to talk to him. And I cannot thank him enough for taking the time to chat with me. And uh, I think he enjoyed it. I don't know. You be the judge. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Dom Jolly. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time with me. Live via satellite from the sunny, is it the Cotswolds? It is. I'm in Cheltenham, which is the capital of the Cotswolds, but I like to just say I live in Nam. Nam. Delta Nam. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the Nam. He's in the yeah. shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tom Jolly, everybody. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all good, right. Good, good. As all right as one can do these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? No one can. Every email I get starts with that. Yeah. I hope you're okay in this troubling time. It's like, look, fuck it. We all know we're in lockdown. Yeah. Let's just move on. Stop wasting my time. I feel I'm, like I need to write that, but like if someone yeah. wrote back that was like, no, I'm fucked. I need help. Will yeah, you help I agree. me? Yeah. I'm like, what am I going to do? <laughs> On the other hand, if you wrote and said, uh, oh, having a, seriously, having a brilliant time in lockdown, yeah, yeah. then it's worse. So yeah, there's no winners. So just ignore I'm, it. We all I'm, know. <laughs> I'm getting so late. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, it's yeah. like a high five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> These lockdown hoes. Yeah. <laughs> they got nowhere to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who's there? Me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, when I asked you to do the show, and we were just talking about this before, uh, you yeah. kind of immediately said 1990, but then <laughs> now you're like, I really don't know why I said 1990. Well, because you gave me the choice of things to do, and I, I thought, well, 60s, obviously I wasn't alive, so that's going to be difficult to talk about my, my TV habits then. 70s, I normally film-wise, I'd always choose 70s, but I was quite young in the 70s, but I did watch a lot of TV. But I grew up in Lebanon for complicated reasons. So Lebanese TV, you know, growing up was very limited. So for a start, it was all, any American or British shows had French and Arabic subtitles underneath. And whoever wrote the French, the French and Arabic subtitles, it was different people. <laughs> And sometimes the subtitles would have nothing to do with the actual show. It was like an excuse for a budding poet to put stuff in. <laughs> and then other times, so people, depending on, you know, obviously I'm, I'm English, but I had Lebanese friends who would either watch stuff in Arabic or French. And if you're watching a comedy show, even something like Benny Hill, which was very popular in Lebanon, uh, people would be laughing at completely different times, depending on what the subtitles were. <laughs> but growing up, I remember watching things like, you know, the things I really love, Flintstones, uh, Eight is Enough, which I've never heard of again. Are you familiar with Eight is oh, Enough? Oh, yeah, it was a massive yeah. show here. Okay, yeah. because for, it wasn't in England. Like, no one's ever heard of it. But I watched that Six Million Dollar Man. Oh, my God, that just changed my life. That was amazing. 
Um, and I loved Hong Kong Fooey. Uh, th those are the sort of things I remember watching. A lot of cartoons, you know. Yeah. I'm very American. So actually, interestingly for me, it's it's almost technically knee jerk. I should be anti American as a Brit co comedian. It's kind of a rite of passage. But I've always grown up as being very pro American. I mean, obviously, I married one born in Seattle, but Canadian. So depending when Trump's in power, she's Canadian. Yeah. But you know, it's fair. <laughs> but I grew up just looking at America on telly, just thinking, oh, I just want to go to this place. I love this place. So I've always been very pro American that way. So I think your television did did a lot of did a lot of good service in that. So I, for, for those of us in the States, like Lebanon is, weirdly, we have a ton, of, at least in the Boston area, there's a ton of Lebanese people here. Are there? Um, it's a, it's, we have, we have enclaves of a ton of, it's the second biggest Armenian population and like the second or third biggest Lebanese population in the US. How weird. I don't know yeah. why. I, I think there's resettlement. Lebanon has a, Lebanon's a bit like Israel. Well, it's very unlike Israel in a lot of places, yeah. but it's also got a massive diaspora. So, you know, I went, I'm, a, I'm also a travel writer as I was a comedian. I went to the Congo uh monster hunting as you do yes and like all the corner shops in the congo in brazzaville are run by lebanese i'm like how do you get there <laughs> yeah. there's whole towns there's a place called zahli in, in lebanon in 1956 for some reason the whole town moved to brazil and they have a town there so yeah it is weird like that it's yeah good. well there was i think there was a lot of towns that uh like in the at post-industrial revolution everybody yeah. this is going to get fascinating i love uh, this post-industrial revolution uh, when that stuff started to die like yeah. especially after the second world war a lot of cities in an effort to just get people to yeah. live there because yeah. the the birth rates were down and people were, were fleeing yeah, yeah, yeah. the cities um were just like hey anyone from <laughs> who wants to get out of their country yeah yeah, yeah. it's a free citizenship yeah just i mean literally yeah. literally trump's nightmare yes you know that? yeah but we had we had things called i think uh 10 pound poms uh, when Australia was trying to, after we'd sent all our people who'd stolen stuff to Australia, <laughs> we then realized Australia was quite nice and Australia was doing quite well. And they did a thing called 10 pound poms where I think they gave you 10 pounds and allowed you to go there. And even now I'm trying to do a show at the moment. Occasionally you'll see this thing in a newspaper and it's always Italy, Italian mayors of, of really like hilltop villages, the sort of place that normally You'd go and pay, you know, ten thousand pounds a month to rent a villa there. Everyone has left the village. Like all the grandparents have died. They've all moved to Milan to become heroin addicts or whatever. And so this mayor is offering people houses in the village for one euro. There's always a slight catch. You have to spend a minimum amount. You have to spend like thirty thousand euros doing up your thing. But I'm like, I want to do that. So oh I'm, yeah, one day I'm going to buy a one euro italian house <laughs> there's there's a whole uh what a what a pound stretcher um yeah, there is a uh there's a whole like people will share those articles sometimes too and it'll be like you can live in this whole <laughs> castle in yeah. scotland only catch is you got to be the town doctor i love that <laughs> like, well, okay. but that's the thing i like the most i mean i wanted to do a reality show where you know i buy 10 of these houses we move into the village uh, everyone's given 30,000 euro to do up their house and the winner is voted for it. I'm giving away my format here, but the winner at the end is basically keeps the thing and I keep the other nine houses. But what I liked is in the meantime, this village has got to run itself. So what yeah. if he's got to be the policeman? What if he's got to run the bar? I love that. I think it's great. <laughs> my uncle was in this totally cool to go on tangents, by the way, Yeah, yeah, because uh, I'm going to do it. Um, my uncle was in the Coast Guard and he was stationed on this island off the coast of Rhode Island called okay. um, Block Island, which is uh -huh. like a one mile by one mile square island. And it's a summer place. But in the in the off season, literally there's like six people that live on this island. So the mayor owned the post office and the grocery store. See, so I love if, that. if you wanted to go shopping, you had to call him yeah. and be like, Hey, I'm quick. Can I go do my grocery shop? And he'd be like, yeah, I'll meet you in a half hour. <laughs> it's like that kind of stuff. I did this thing years ago. I never made the show, but, uh, on the back of the show I'm famous for trigger happy, like you suddenly get offered loads of stuff. And I really wanted to do travel shows. And someone pitched me this show, and it was such a great idea. It was called Take Me to Your Leader. And basically, the, prem the premise was that I was dropped in a country, and I had to, within a certain period of time, like 48 hours. So the opening credit is me, you know, in, let's say, Congo. You know, they go, what is your reason for visiting Congo? I go, I'm here to meet your leader. <laughs> and I had to, in 48 hours, somehow meet the leader. And the joke was always going to be that if I ever did, we'd be having this slightly awkward breakfast where I hadn't really thought about what it was I was going to say or anything. But anyway, we were starting at the top. So we started with America and it was George Bush then. 
and we'd slowly move our way down. And we found this place called Vanuatu, which is a very interesting island anyway in the in the Pacific. But it so turns out that the Prime Minister of Vanuatu is also the head of the Australian rules football team. <laughs> so you could just ring him up. He was in the yellow pages, you know, the the, the address book. So it yeah. is possible. I like that. I like a place like that. <laughs> Because was was um the uh, happy hour show the only travel show you did? Because you've done I've a lot done, of travel writing, right? I've done. I've written three, four travel books. Uh, so happy. I did Dom Jolly's. I did first one called Dom Jolly's Excellent Adventure, uh, which was as part of a series in which they decided they'd get celebrities to go off on their kind of dream trip. But most celebrities were not very original. So we had Mini Driver for some reason wanted to go and swim with sperm whales. This was the the idea and why not yeah but really they thought great we'll see minnie in a bikini she'll swim with sperm whales but there was nothing else to the show you just fly her there so they had to sort of make this tenuous travel thing and then there was a guy called vinnie jones is a footballer he wants oh, yeah. to go he wants to go <laughs> trout fishing in mongolia well he didn't okay. he wanted to go trout fishing he didn't realize how boring and flat mongolia is so he moaned all the way anyway this was the show and um what's his name the guy that was in home alone Macaulay Culkin? Macaulay Culkin was set up to do one. And for various reasons we won't go into, but he's had a problematic life. He dropped yes. out. So they said to me, would you like to do one? And I said, yes, I would. As and people they... always do when Macaulay Culkin drops out, they go to yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I'm the sort of number two guy. And, uh, and so they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I would like to go back to Lebanon where I grew up. And when we were in Lebanon, we used to go off on expeditions. My dad was like an amateur archaeologist and go into Syria. And this was just before the Syrian civil war. And so we did. We went back to Lebanon. I went to my old school where it turned out, I found out I went to school with Osama bin Laden for a year, which was a very weird thing to discover. I didn't know him. He was 10 years older than me. But, you know, there was a moment when he and I were at the same school together. And that is odd, um, especially as it was a Quaker school, like Quakers are pacifists. <laughs> was it literally a Quaker school? Yeah, it was a Quaker school called Bramana High School, built by Quakers from Darlington in the north of England in 1880. And Quakers, I mean, their entire thing is basically pacifism. Yeah. How badly did they fuck up? So I know. <laughs> when potential parents come round and the headmistress is going, uh, maybe you have heard of our uh, famous alumni, uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, Dom jo Please don't go, don't go. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we went off into Syria and, and we did this amazing road trip, you know, because when we got to the Syrian border, the Syrian government, because I was technically a journalist in this show, because I'm a sort of journalist, they... Uh, gave us this guy turned up and he said i'm your guide and we said it's okay we don't need a guide and he said no 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 i'm your guide <laughs> and we said we don't need a guide and then i suddenly realized oh you're not a guide you're like the secret service guy so but he refused to just admit it so we had this fantastic foil all the way through <laughs> with this guy trying to pretend he was taking pictures which we knew he was sending back to right. damascus and stuff so that was great that was called excellent adventure and on the back of that i did a show series called dom jolly's happy hour where the idea was uh, I was going to get drunk around the world, really, and just look at alcohol in various places. Good job if you can get it. Sky panicked, and then they realized they'd sent us around the world getting drunk. So I had to call it investigating cultural attitudes towards alcohol. Um, <laughs> but that was just brilliant. You know, I mean, we learned nothing. We went to America, Australia and learned that they drink a lot of beer. It yep. was top investigation. Oh, yeah, I love that show. It was yeah. great. Yeah, I loved it. It was really what it was, was a spoof of travel shows, but a right. bit too early because... Travel shows, TV is supposed to be about trust. And it's always about, you know, you're going to be transparent. And that's come more and more into television. But travel shows are still the last lie. You know, like y your presenter goes to, let's say, Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And he, decide, and he goes into the insect market. And there he bumps into someone over the deep fried crocus that turns out to be his guide. Now, you know, and I know, that the producer hired this person, the fixer, they met in the hotel and they said, you know what? It'd be interesting to meet somewhere exotic. Like, you're lying straight away. Yeah. And then Michael Palin, he's around the world in 80 days. There's always like, you know, there's a shot of a train. He goes, we got to Alexandria with just four minutes left. If just we missed this train, we would not catch our connection to Timbuktu. And you go, okay. And he gets on it. And then there's a beautiful shot of the train leaving and go, well, who the fuck took that? Who'd you leave behind? Yeah, yeah, you leave yeah, behind? Yeah, yeah. So we all know that. And, and also there's rules, you know, like you can only ever arrive or leave somewhere when the sun is setting and up. Often I'd get somewhere in an hour. I yep. wanted to go to sleep in the hotel. No, we have to wait for magic hour. All that stuff I love. Yeah. So I liked, I liked spoofing that, but I did a couple of other ones. I did a rough guide to um, Nicaragua 
which I really enjoyed. Went to Nicaragua. Uh, I just did a show which no one's seen. It went out in 50 countries, but because it was partly paid for by a beer company, couldn't be shown in England. It was called How Beer Changed the World. But I went around the world drinking beer, so I didn't care where it was shown, frankly. Right. Yeah. Right. So no, I, mean, I love that it. That stuff's fascinating, and I and I love that stuff as well. Yeah, with the reality shows, it's hilarious. I, I, I always oh. wonder if people know that it's fake but just don't want to admit themselves like i always say to people i'm like read the credits there's yeah. writers well it's interesting that because i've i've weirdly because of my very limited skill set in my comedy my comedy is ad-libbed you know it's right. not written so in america if things went well you'd end up you go from ad-libbing on a hidden camera show to you know even curb enthusiasm stuff like that that's basically ad-libbed right. in england ad-libbing it has this terrible word improvisation and you just sound like some wanker that's been in a drama school and it's awful. Right. So actually reality shows are quite good for me because it's a place where I can, I most proper comics freeze when they're in real situations because they need a yeah. script. I actually thrive on it because I like the, you know, making it up. So I've been on a lot of those reality shows and I know what you're saying. And there are the type that are obviously scripted and, and you have to be, I mean, I'm obsessed currently with, this show called 90 Day Fiance. I don't know if you've seen it. It's yes. just, it's fantastic. And what's amazing about 90 Day Fiance is I've never seen a show spawn from itself so much. There's pre, the, so you know the concept. It's yep. if you marry, if you get engaged to someone abroad as an American, they get a K-1 visa, which allows them 90 days in which they can come to the States, but they have to marry or leave. So you think, fuck, that's a format. That's amazing. They have the before the 90 days, the 90 days, after the 90 days. They even have a sort of goggle box thing where they have previous contestants of 90 Day Fiance watching the the other series. And now they have spin-off shows from them. They're amazing. And everyone on that show is essentially punching above their weight. It's Americans, either men or women, going abroad, punching above their weight to get someone better than them, but also thinking they're essentially hiring an au pair. Right. It's fantastic. I right. love that show. Well, yeah. Which is sort of not uniquely American, but there's the, there's no, the no, we'd here. be just as bad, but Where no one like, wants to come here. <laughs> everyone wants to be here. Everyone oh, wants to be okay. us. Yeah. Do you know what? I mean, but that's a kind of, we have the same arrogance, the same sort of English as the Americans Sense, right? It's constantly like, but they're here for that green card. You go, yeah. have you been to that country? I mean, no one wants to go and live in Buttsville, Ohio. Trust me. Like, yeah, you know, we all want to go to LA or New York, but yeah. trust me, you're not that special. There's a lot of country that they live yeah. in. Like, it's not. I love that yeah, show. Yeah. Um, and also, I'm, I'm obsessed with a show called Below Deck at the moment. I don't know if you've seen Below Deck. No, I haven't seen Below Deck. Oh, my God. So, Below Deck, it's, uh, what's it on? It's on. TLC is it? No, I don't know. But it's Discovery um, or something. Yeah, no. So imagine the world of the super yacht, the super douche, basically the guy yeah. that pays a hundred thousand pounds a week to be on a sort of massive gin palace, and it follows the crew on that. So you're seeing the crew looking after a bunch of just overly privileged <laughs> assholes, but also in the most stunning settings. It's the best. You oh, gotta watch I have that. to put this on my list now. It's the best. Uh, it's the best reality show. It's the most addictive I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I always gravitated to your comedy to to pull back to the ad lib thing is that that I'm a stand up, but that's kind of my thing too. And and yeah, it's it's funny because I I got a review once that was like a better summation of eight years of therapy than I've ever had than in this one <laughs> sentence where this reviewer said, uh, "Ken likes to create chaotic." Uh, chaotic things he can control on stage or chaotic experience he can control. I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. And it's like, okay. It, it is weird that, isn't it? All comedy of in a sense is therapy. It's just that we're unable to realize that's what we're doing until someone points it out. Yeah. And by then it's probably too late. You go, shit, I wish I'd known that. Yeah. I'm... I actually had the answer. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was stuck this whole time. Yeah. Um, so Lebanon, for, for people here, like aside from we know Lebanese, people are like, I've had Lebanese food. We yeah. didn't get a lot of coverage of like the war or all the stuff going on there. And like the sum total knowledge of most Americans, Lebanon is like the human league song. Like that's, I, I, I think that's unfair. Actually. I think uh, most probably do know about Lebanon, but only for the fact that it's a place where occasionally Americans get kidnapped. There's always a war going on. Right. And, and to them, you know, there's even that expression looks like Beirut, yes. you know, uh, which was fair at a certain stage, but sure. uh, Le Beirut's now been rebuilt. Now, actually, there's a Lebanese guy who now sues anyone who uses that phrase. <laughs> As he should. Just, he does. And I, I'm very glad you, 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 you keyed this up for me because I've actually just written my last book was called, actually, it was a terrible mistake. I called it the Hezbollah Hiking Club because I thought it was a, snappy title as right. it is it's made it absolutely impossible to sell in the middle east so it's actually being re-released now as the downhill hiking club but in that i went back to lebanon and because 
because it's kind of the thing that really irritates me. I've lived off the fact that I grew up in Lebanon and went to school with Osama bin Laden. It sounds cool, you know, like yeah. people, people go, but you must be incredibly brave. And I go, I kind of am, but you know, I don't want to talk about it. Whereas actually people again think Lebanon, Middle East, it's desert camels. It's not. Lebanon is a mixture of the South of France and California. It's pine forests. Where I lived, it was an hour to the beach, the Mediterranean, an hour to the ski slopes. There's great skiing. The food is insane. The women are astonishing. Everyone speaks three languages. There's just the occasional war going on. And so I kind of, there hasn't been a war in Lebanon since 1990. And uh, I just thought I want people to know, I felt I owed something back having lived vicariously off it. So I found out that there was a hiking trail uh, set up called the Lebanon Mountain Trail that is 27 days that you walk either from the Israeli border in the south across the spine of Lebanon, across some quite high mountains to the Syrian border in the north, or you can do it the other way around. And I thought that's a great in to Lebanon um, in my attempt to become the new Bill Bryson, uh, <laughs> peace be upon him. And uh, so I, that's what I did. I took two of my friends who'd never been to Lebanon and we walked across Lebanon for 27 days. And it was the greatest adventure I'd ever done because it really was like when I grew up in Lebanon, there was a war. So I didn't really explore it. And it's just such an amazing country. And people are so grateful that you've come there for just tourism, you know, like, and and honestly, I know you're all thinking, what? I'd never go to Lebanon for tourism. You've got to trust me on this. Well, firstly, you've got to read my book because when you read it, you will realize you want to go there. And I've had so many pictures of people now hiking across Lebanon with my book and nothing has made me happy in that. Well, Bill Bryson's sales would make me happy. Yes, but, yeah. but with the help of your Second. podcast, Ken, yes. we're going to have it. Yeah, Every single person's going to buy one. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll move some books. But I mean, that's, you know, as as you and I are probably a little bit cynical about television, especially, re- or, you know, reality TV. Very uh, much so. But the one sort of kind of nice thing about those yeah. travel shows is you is you can do that. I mean, this was a book, but you can showcase places that have a reputation that's probably unfair or outdated. Yeah. And and that is kind of nice because seeing it for people yeah. is well, it's is a whole you need thing. you need to shoehorn it for people. But the other problem, you know, I'm a travel writer as well, and it's one of the big nightmares. If you can hear a saw in the background, it's not my wife about to kill me. It's my neighbor who's yeah. making a bathroom. Yes. I will kill him after this. That's his no story. Way. He's yeah. not dismembering somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, we're not armed here in, the, in England, so right. I can't shoot him. I know. But you're in the country. Some... You just have feed him the pigs. I, I will do that. I do have <laughs> pigs, actually. With yeah, these, they'll yeah. eat anything. That's yeah, the best way to get do. rid of a body. <laughs> That's true. I know that. I know that. Um, but one of the nightmares with being a travel writer is this imbalance you have because part of you longs to go somewhere that either people have a wrong idea about or they haven't been to, which is very rare, and you write this amazing thing and you you discover it. On the other hand, if you find somewhere amazing, you don't want these assholes coming there. Right. I don't want you to be there. I want it for myself. So there is there is a part of you thinking, oh, I don't want to share this. It's a bit like loving a band, you know, like when you love a band so much and no one's heard of them and you're trying to play it to all your mates and you just think they're incredible. And then suddenly they have a big hit and you kind of hate them because – Everyone's like, oh, yeah, I love that band. And you're going, but I like them first. Yeah, I, mean, I want credit for this. Yeah, I want it. It's an ego thing, really. You know, this that's is, why we're comics. This is making me think that a great genre would be deathbed travel shows. So it's nice. like travel writers and it's all the places they kept to themselves, but nice. they have like six months to live. And they're that's like, well, nice. I, yeah. I can't use yeah. it anymore. So yeah, yeah, yeah. here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But speaking of 1990, where you said when the, nice the link. war, nice war link. in Lebanon ended, I'm a professional. Yeah, yeah. Um, this issue was from 1990. To your point, you you were in Lebanon until you were like 18, so it was like 86 well, or 88 Well, yeah, but I was at school in England, uh, in boarding school. So like, I spent half my life in a civil war, half my life with members of Radiohead and the current Tory cabinet. So right. it was like a balanced childhood. Just like a bitchy civil war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I went to Goldsmiths for a bit, so I, 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 did I have you? a very, very limited uh, experience of that kind of thing. Nice. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it's... It's weird the TV you watch in your early 20s, because if you watch TV at all, I imagine you're probably out, you know, going to music and, you know. If you're watching TV, I mean, this is why when I chose this, this is 1990, right? So 67, 77, 87. Yeah, so I'm 23 here. So really, if I'm watching too much TV, I'm a loser here. Or maybe I'm massively stoned. It's one of the two, actually. Probably massively stoned. So yeah. 
It'd be interesting to see. It could be both. Yeah. Um, but yeah, actually, <laughs> <laughs> to your point, like we got Benny Hill too. And, oh, no. you know, and, and if anyone until recently, really like the last 10 years, if you mentioned UK comedy, people here would be like, love that Benny Hill. Oh, Jesus. It's and like, are you being served? That was wherever it. Wherever I travel, you know, if I say, this is the joke about Bill Bryson, you know, if, if ever people I'm introduced to a travel writer, they go, ah, Bill Bryson. I, and my friend goes, well, yeah, but without the sales, you know. Right. And when I traveled as a comedian, everyone is like, ah, Mr. Bean, even yeah. crossing. I was arrested in Syria and I was in some quite dodgy place. And, and the guy was really angry and there were guns. And then suddenly a comedian came out. And the moment I mentioned Mr. Bean, I then claimed... <laughs> You know, to be his best friend, yeah. Mr. Bean saved me. So yeah, that's all right. I'm I'm Master Bean. I'm, yeah. I'm the yeah. junior. I'm Mr. Bean Junior. There's when I first moved to the UK in 2001. And we'll dive into the guy in a second here, but you may or may not remember this. There was a guy named something Langley. He was like a journalist. I can't think of what his first name was. Okay. And he did a show, and I don't know if it was Dispatches or whatever it was, mm -hmm. but he <gasps> was behind Sean the, Langham. Yes, Sean Langham. Langham. I Langham. know Sean. I okay. know Sean very so well. Yeah. He did a second one of this, but I've never been able to find this original one. Yeah. It came out right after 9-11 but he had filmed it before he was behind yeah. the lines with the taliban and he had hidden cameras and everything yeah i know and this. the funniest thing in it though was the taliban banned all music yeah. except for the venga boys yes that's right it's so very he, weird he would be like having this discussion of this hidden camera and be like so you know they're gonna kill someone in the town square and then you'd hear uh, 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 and he's like i have to go <laughs> and it, it was real <laughs> it, it could be argued that the venga boys is not music so that's true uh, i think that's true it. What I loved about Sean Langham was that often, you know, all foreign, Sean's a, Sean was a kind of gonzo foreign correspondent. You know, he was the first of the amateur, well, not the first of the amateurs, but um, Sean, uh, foreign correspondents always trying to look cool. And what I loved about Sean was that he, you know, knowing him, he is a bit of a coward, <laughs> uh, as we all are. And he would show that, you know, you'd show him crying or really nervous or terrified he was going to get killed and i love that human side to that yeah because he's a guy he looked like elvis costello <laughs> yeah he basically. did he was a nerd yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And it he was, was a nerd i have not been able to find that show and i tell people about it and they're like yeah, yeah that sounds made up and i'm like no no, no it's really they'd not come in with a jeep and guns blasting no, the venga would. boys it's amazing yeah so you never know what travels to where they're like oh venga boys that's cool yeah 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 um so let's dive in here this issue this is actually Sweeps Week 1990, which what is that a mean? thing we have in America that we've had since the beginning of TV. And the way that television ads are sold to this okay. day is they have two sort of bars of ratings and they calculate them in uh, November and in February. And that's when they go, this is the rating. So this is what you pay for a rate for ads. So it sets the rates. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So they do all kinds of stunts to get artificially inflated ratings that so you're buying just ads for before the sweeps exactly exactly okay. so you get a bunch of stunts you get like big tv movies and that sort yeah, of stuff yeah, yeah. so so this week there's a made for tv mini series about elvis that yeah, stars michael that. gerard who's in um hairspray if you've ever seen hairspray the I john have, waters yeah. movie he's he plays tracy turnblad's uh like love interest he looks just like okay. Elvis. and so they pumped millions of dollars into this and it died like Elvis on the massive toilet. bomb, <laughs> yeah. massive bomb. Yeah. Nobody gave a shit and it yeah. looked cool, but it yeah. just was not like, yeah. who cares? It was not interesting. Yeah. You can't pastiche Elvis anyway. No, it was, and it was not the interesting era of Elvis that people care about. It was yeah. early Elvis. Yeah. Yeah. And people yeah were like, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't really know which era of Elvis I am interested in. I never, I actually went, when I did my dark tourist book, I did an assassination vacation road trip around America because I'm weirdly interested in assassinations and right. American politics. Most of which and, are in the South. <laughs> it, it, weirdly. So, you know, so obviously I did where Bobby Kennedy was shot, although that's not there anymore. And then I did JFK, uh, Martin Luther King, you know, walking along Lincoln, little stuff like that. But um, I, on the way in Memphis, because that's where Martin Luther King was shot, I went to Gracelands. And actually the most interesting fact I found out about Elvis is that we all know he died on the John. And so therefore he technically died of supposedly an overdose or, you know, a, taking a big shit. But actually my theory is different because do you know what he was doing before he retired to the bathroom? Uh, watching TV? Well, that's what you'd think. But no, Elvis had built a racquetball court. Uh, he got really into racquetball, which is that weird game you kind of see Michael Douglas playing in films and no yep. one else really. 80s and yuppies, it was Yeah, huge. very, yeah. like with the glasses and stuff. Yep. And there's always the fat lawyer friend and then Michael Douglas playing yep. racquetball. And uh, 
So he'd had quite an, ex- uh, he got into racquetball and I think trying to lose weight and he'd played racquetball and fell ill and left and gone. So technically I think Elvis died of a sports injury. That would make sense. Yeah. That would make sense. So I quite like that. It makes him better. I love collecting stories about Elvis insanity. And there was one that I heard forever and I thought was an urban legend. And I interviewed John Cleese last year and I confirmed that it was real. So I don't know yeah. if you ever heard this one, but Elvis was obsessed with Monty Python. Obsessed. Okay, I didn't know this. And he in the early seventies purchased one of the first videotape machines. So this mm-hmm. was like a, a TV news room size videotape machine. I, I've seen the room. He has yeah. all that. Yeah. Yeah. He's so that he screen specifically so he could watch Monty Python. No, I love the that. Hilarious part. He had someone, a stenographer, uh, do a transcript of all the sketches and he would make the Memphis mafia guys do no. Monty Python sketches with him. So Please Elvis tell me would, he filmed it. I met. I wish. I wish. Because that's just, the oh, lost like, tapes. You yeah. Want. Hey, man. That oh, the parrot's dead. Like that kind <laughs> yeah. of stuff. And that these parrot dummies, is no longer living, sir. <laughs> these dummies didn't. They're like, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'm reading it. I'm reading it. Yeah. I, I asked her, please. Like, no, that was a hundred percent true. That is amazing. <laughs> How cool is that? My favorite Elvis story is uh, he was obsessed with a certain place. Uh, I can't, you know, obviously he lived in Memphis, and I can't remember where it was, but it was in another state, and he was obsessed with the toasted peanut butter, bacon, banana. Yep. Yeah. And and he had a plane that would fly and pick up the sandwich and come back. Nevada. I mean, I know now. Yeah, that's right. I know now that's just normal Kardashian behavior. But yeah. in those days, it was pretty good. I like yeah, that. it was before we had fried peanut butter, banana, bacon sandwiches on every cor- street corner yeah. here in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you have dealers now. Exactly. Yeah. So j- that era is fascinating to me because you see a guy who no one ever told him no. And he's like, this not that smart. Yeah. poor guy who's yeah, just yeah. like hey man i had an idea uh and also would make jokes that no one understood but he thought were hilarious which is always funny to me yeah <laughs> like yeah. i interviewed um ronnie tut who was his drummer yeah and ronnie goes man elvis had a great sense of humor but i never got it like <laughs> he had these private jokes like one day he gave me a watch and i was like oh thanks e and he goes no read the inscription man and i read it, and it says uh two four eight from squirrely and I didn't know what that meant. And he goes, right, right. And he starts laughing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, no clue. That's, isn't that terrible? Because Elvis probably didn't have a good sense of humor. But as he got more and more famous, everyone just was forced to laugh. And then one day, it's like, you know, it's like that theory that the queen in England, not that I, I know that I'm English. I don't always talk about the queen. Um, the queen thinks everywhere in the world smells of fresh paint. Yes. Because everywhere she goes, people are painting like that. And Elvis must have just thought he's hilarious. It's but occasionally, so he must have been left in a room with people not in his payroll or who didn't know who he was. And he would have bombed. Oh, yeah. That would have been good for him, I think. My second favorite story, and then I'll stop telling you all the stories I see. Oh, I like this. Is uh, Alice Cooper who was met. in Las oh. Vegas, and he gets, a, he gets a note that, like, Elvis wants to meet you. Okay. So he's like, okay, this is like mid seventies. So he shows up at the place and, uh, he gets in the elevator and in the elevator, it's, it's him, Linda Loveless from Deep Throat. Debbie does. Oh no. Yeah. Deep Throat. Yeah. yeah. And Chubby Checker. Nice. So he's That's like a band. Okay. So they go up there and Elvis is there and he's just like, Hey man, you know, and he's just like holding court and, uh, he sort of corners Alice Cooper in the kitchen and he goes, uh, Hey man, you're the guy with that, uh, that snake, right? And he goes, yeah, I have a snake. He goes, man, I wish I thought of that. Anyway, uh, you know how to take a gun from a man? <laughs> and he goes, no, not really. And uh, he he takes a gun out of a drawer and he puts it in Alice Cooper's hand. And Alice Cooper goes, before I could even do anything, I'm on the ground with Elvis's boot <laughs> on my throat. And he's got the gun. He goes, that's how you do it, man. All right. And then he didn't say anything else. He just walks away. <laughs> I, like, I love that. What? You know what? If I was Elvis, I'd do that shit. You just yeah. do whatever you want by that yeah. stage. Why Him not? and Marlon Brando were the kind of guy where it's just like, whatever I want, people will you just, just think, say nothing. Yeah, there, there's probably an initial couple of years where you think, oh, come on, Elvis, remember your roots. And then you just think, you know what, Elvis, you do what the fuck you want. Go all out, man. Yeah. Hire a bacon person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all they do. Hire uh, a plane made of cheese. Yes. Uh, so this is also because it's sweep week. It's the Grammy week. So there's a big thing about the 1990 Grammys yeah. uh, in here, which I realize how much of a awful year 1990 was for pop music in the united states yeah uh we have uh, don henley and all that kind of stuff but you know what it was 1990 was interesting <clears throat> because there's a very weird period it, there's a very sort of weird music period between about 1986 when new romantics and even goth and i was a goth stuff finished and then with the rise suddenly of, of nirvana and grunge 
everything picked up again. And the only real thing going on in those four years of any interest were Pixies, who were before anyone in that, and then weird things like Black Flag and some Washington bands, DC bands. But it was a very fallow year. And that was the four years I was at university. So oh, that's we an were awful desperate. time. But yeah. yeah, but then in England, it all kicked off suddenly. Stone Roses, all that yep. happened. That was our grunge. Teenage uh, fan yeah. club and all that kind exactly. of stuff. Yeah. Um, side note, because I'm a huge music fan and we have similar yeah. tastes. And this is a band that, to your point earlier, that I try to tell everyone about. And I don't understand why they're not huge. Are yeah. you a fan of the sound Adrian Bowen has oh, been? You are fucking with me. No. This is my band. That's this my, my band. band. No, That's my part, band. Party of my mind. In so that good. album. It's the most amazing album. Monument. The Longest Days? Oh, my God. I paint this town. I mean, honestly. I've Total never Recall? Heard it. No one ever I don't knows know them. anyone knows this band. I don't know why? That is, like, I, I think I've put them on Trigger Happy. I put them on new Trigger Happy. I think I invite you to the, to party, the party of, of my mind. mind. An invitation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I... That band should be the biggest band in the world. And I finally thought, I've never actually looked them up. I looked them up. He committed suicide. Committed suicide, yeah. It was terrible. They, and they've had four albums, I think. And they were sort of what you'd call post-punk. Yeah. But they were punk. And oh, my God. They're, uh, that's amazing. They were a punk band before. They're called The Outsiders. Yeah, 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 they yeah. Were the first, No one's but, ever heard of that no, band. No, I always yeah. say to people, I'm like, this is the band that should have the reputation Joy Division has. This is the, <laughs> like, exactly. You know I mean? I, it's so true. And this is, uh, you know, I've always wanted to make a documentary on them because no one knows them. It's yeah. incredible. Uh, Stuart Lee, uh, a stand-up comedian, just yep. made an amazing documentary, if you can catch it. He was obsessed with a band called The Nightingales, who were amazing. Same kind of era, actually. And they just never made it, but they were kind of local legends. And he's just made this documentary called King Rocker. Oh, I need and to see that. And it's fantastic. And, and on the back of that, the Nightingales are suddenly rediscovered and they're on tour. And it makes you so happy. And they're still a great band. They haven't yeah. fucked up. But the sound, oh my God, that is so weird. I, I just, genuinely, they're my pet band that like same. no one's ever heard of. Yeah. And the incredible. only reason I know of them, and and I was like, if anyone maybe heard of them, just because I've, you know, obviously know your musical taste from the Trigger Up and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I when I lived in London, I was in some record store on like Berwick Street or something. Yeah. And in a pound bin, they had a 12 inch of a song from From the Lion's Mouth. I think it was oh, yeah. uh, winning. And That's I was the like, orange one, isn't yes, it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I was like, this looks kind of cool. And I got yeah, I was yeah. like, this is fucking amazing. What is this? Someone gave me, uh, someone left me. Uh, they stayed at my house and they left their records. And one of them was the, uh, what's the album with the party in my mind, the broken glass. Oh one. yeah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. It, yeah. It's, I mean, that is, in, it's just every song on that is amazing. It's, yeah. it's unbelievably good. Yeah. Like just the baseline from oh my God. Do you know what I'm going to do from, on my do, Twitch do, do, do. channel? You know, I said I was on Twitch. Yeah. One of the things I'm loving doing on Twitch, although it's difficult because you can't, you know, you have to worry about copyright, but actually that is what Twitch is made for is I've suddenly, cause I'm started playing songs that I like, because, you know, sometimes I go on shows and I think I want to play this and they go, it's not on our playlist. Like, I don't give yeah. a fuck about your That's playlist. I just, yeah. I just want to put something I like that you haven't heard. That's what I'm going to do. I'm yeah. going to make the sound famous on my Twitch. Yes, please do. That's please good. do. That is, we've done it. Uh, and his, his actually, his album before, right before he died, the acoustic record, oh. it's the saddest fucking thing I've ever heard yeah. in my life. Like oh. you knew it was coming. Oh, but he's such a good lyricist. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thing about that, that. Honestly, I'm no joke. I have never spoken to anyone about the sound. I Me either. That, I was like, how has no one ever heard of this? Yes. Band? It's yeah. it's like we're from an alternate reality or yeah. they were like erased from history or something. Yeah. I'm like, what yeah. is this? I mean, because uh, I loved the band, not quite on the same level because they did have hits, but in the 90s, for instance, there's a band called House of Love uh, and House of Love did this album called Chrysalis that I think is the greatest album of the 90s. And because they were fighting between the singer and the and the songwriter as often happens, the Oasis syndrome, they, they never quite made it, which I was happy with. But God, I love those bands that should have been bigger. You know, yeah. it's incredible. I mean, my 90s, they don't, obviously. They live. No, yeah. Um, my <laughs> yeah. 90s band of that era is probably the Afghan Wigs, Ooh, um, yes, very who much are so. great. But like people, uh, if I mention them, people will be like, oh, yeah, I heard of them. Yeah. But, like the sound, even, they're just like, you're making even, this up. It's not a real even band. Even the name, I think, frightens people a bit. You know, yeah. and they think, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can. Yeah. I'm like, no, it's like if Big Black was into soul music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, how is that? Uh, oh, well, this, we've already. Oh, I'm so happy. Yeah. Uh, so let's dive in. What did you yeah. pick on uh, Saturday night? And, and oh, you should mention uh, you'd never seen a US TV guide. Your wife kind of explained it to you. Well, I mean, I got what it was. You know, the TV guide's not a, it's not something I grew up with, but I was right. immediately aware of what it was because in England, obviously, we have the Radio Times and the TV Times, uh, weirdly, both of which do TV. 
Although Radio Times called Radio. So I presume in the old days it just did radio. So and the yeah, weird thing go- about that is Radio Times, sorry to interrupt you, Radio yeah. Times was just BBC and yes. TV Times was ITV and Channel 4. So you That's had right. two magazines for yeah. four channels. For four channels, yeah. But we were excited <laughs> about that. Right. And, you know, I, again, I didn't grow up in England, but I, when I came and stayed with really, really dull relatives, and in fact, where I live now in Chelton Arm, um, there was, uh, my aunt lived here and she would have them, laid out at the beginning of the week and she would have put her little glasses on little glass of sherry and you know, literally a scene from midsummer murders you know and then she would have just circled things like songs of praise and <laughs> antiques roadshow and that was it that was her week you know there was that's she planned it out and i think i don't know you you said when we were talking earlier about it and you said you had a weird upbringing i think it gave people a certain structure like you knew what was coming and isn't that weird how that is the exact opposite of what tv is becoming now yeah you know whereas that sort of appointment tv has gone like when you see something you want to just binge it now i haven't got time it's interesting that it's weird yeah th- this show we end up sort of focusing just on pre-millennium tv for that very yeah. reason because there was so much stuff that I, I i didn't coin this but i call stumble upon culture where lovely yeah you just either had to watch it because someone else was watching it. you never yeah. would have watched it yourself and you ended up yeah. loving it or you're flipping through the channels and you're like what is this and the yeah. The thing I always cite is uh, MTV here used to show the young ones late at night, yeah, back yeah, to yeah. back with the monkeys. Yeah. And I caught it and it was the episode with the damned. And I was like six years old and I was like, I don't know what this is, but this but is I love everything it. I love in the world yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. if I had not seen that, yeah. like, my life would be totally different. So- and also an algorithm would not know you would like that. No. So an algorithm would look at your normal, however eclectic your viewing stuff is. You know that algorithm would never show you the young ones. No. Because algorithms gonna, are wankers. Yeah, it's going to give you more of what you already like. Yeah. yeah so you're never exactly. going to be challenged. Algorithms are the death of creativity. They're yeah. never going to challenge you to leave your little area. Absolutely. And the other thing is investment is a big deal. And what I mean by that is either financially, so like there are so many records I bought as a kid that I listened to. I was like, I hate this. But yeah. then I'm like, I spent 10 bucks. I'm going to sit and listen to it till I yeah, like yeah. it. And then it's yeah. been like my favorite or a movie, you know, you rented yeah. it, you're going to watch it. And investment here, I mean, in time. So like that time you took to plan this out, yeah. you're like, look, I've been planning to watch this since t- Monday. Yeah, I'm not really into it, but I'm going to stick with it. And I'm not going to, because I don't have one, sit on my smartphone and kind of half watch it. I'm yeah. going to give it the respect my week deserves. Uh, it's Yeah, I love all that. It's very weird. And also that whole thing of instant versus sticking with something, it's like an album you instantly love, you'll binge on. Mm-hmm. It's like Netflix, you know, and you'll just play it all. But it's gone. But actually the things that are, the albums I still listen to, the ones that took me four or five, and I kind of thought I, I need to like this. You know, but it didn't. It didn't come easy. It never That's does. What's good. Yeah. yeah, you gotta be like, like maybe I need headphones on. Maybe I need yeah, to yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, and maybe then, I need drugs. Yeah, but then <laughs> when it clicks, you're like, oh wow, I get yeah, it yeah, now. Yeah. Whereas, and you're so excited when yes, you get it. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. like if you rent a movie now, you're like two minutes in, don't like it. Next, oh. next, next, next. Well, now, like my kids won't watch movies because they're too long for them. You know, like and and yet. I can't watch movies because they're not enough. Like yeah. now I'm like, what? You just made 90 minutes. That's yeah. it. That, you know, have you seen Breaking Bad? You know, yeah. That's like I'm a 48 Your Honor hour movie. You know? I'm watching Your Honor at the moment. Oh my God. It's, that is, um, it's amazing. Yeah. I, th- and that's sort of what TV has become now. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, well, it's there was movies. a moment when TV became better than movies. I mean, yeah. and that's an, un- yeah, and Breaking Bad was one of those moments, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The yeah. Sopranos was the what Sopranos. Sort of looked at as sort of, I resisted that for so long. Cause I hate I, being told I hate to mob watch stuff it. too. <laughs> oh, me too. And then I finally, in first lockdown, I watched it and I was like, holy shit. I still haven't. I've been like, because especially it. especially here growing up here, there's so many oh, like, yeah. hey, I'm Italian, bada yeah. boom, bingo, but you know bingo. what's You know the one I can't do? The other one of the three, it's always Breaking Bad, uh, Sopranos, and The Wire. Yeah. Firstly, most of the people in The Wire are fucking British, which is yeah. weird. But also The Wire, I've tried now. And then people go, yeah, you've got to stick it to the third season. I go, look. I'll stick three, four shows, but three seasons to get into something? No way. Yeah. Come on. I was like that with Mad Men because everyone, I used to joke <sighs> yeah. about on stage yeah. that everyone recommended yeah. Mad Men to me because yeah, of my haircut. Too. But um, I was like, don't do that to people. But yeah. I, I watched the first season. I'm like, this looks great, but all the characters are unlikable. Like, it's, yeah. I'm just yeah. not enjoying it. Like, it's not compelling. And they're like, well, you got to watch till season That's the nine. Point. And I'm like, yeah. 
You know, oh, okay. I, do you know what? I'm with you. I sort of got into it briefly and I thought, I hate everyone in this. They go, yeah, yeah. but that's the point. I go, I don't need that point. I got other yeah. things to do. I hate a lot yeah. of people already. Yeah. And people got really mad because I was like, Mad Men is like somebody watched Bewitched and yeah. was like, do this without the witch. Yeah, and just take a, out the nice music. Guy yeah. who works in an ad agency in the 60s. And he's just an asshole. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And he works with a lot of assholes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes he has sex. Yeah. Yeah. But he's an asshole. Yeah. I was anyway. like, I, I don't need this. We're never going to get through this week. No, I'm TV, sorry. We? Sorry. No, I'll I don't care. But I mean, uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Let's dive in. So, Saturday night, what uh, what struck out to you, stuck out to you as interesting? Okay. This immediately made me realize that, you know, I'm not an, it, weirdly, as a comedian, I don't watch comedy, for instance. I, well, I do. Actually, I can watch American comedy because if I watch British comedy, if it's good, I'm bitter. If it's bad, I'm angry. So I, I like American comedy. But really, what I watch is reality, either in real, really shit reality shows or documentaries and stuff. I really like it. I find it hard, apart from very well-made drama like Breaking Bad. So looking here, I mean, the first thing that struck me was Cops. And I remember Cops. I mean, now looking back at Cops, I, it's one of the things that's now accused of like every single bad guy on it was a black guy, white cops, booting in people's thing. But firstly, that theme tune, bad boys, bad boys. Inner what circle. You gotta do? Yep. I mean, you just, you were in it. And also it was a very... It, I'm, I don't know the actual facts, but it very much felt like the first time you were almost what it was like a cop show, but real. And without yeah. any of the boring drama, it was just like kick in the door. You're on drugs, drag you out, you know, all that shit and badly filmed. Oh yeah. The it, history, which of that made it real. Yeah, yeah. It felt real. So there's a, there's law, there's a law in most cities in the U S where as a taxpayer, because you pay the salaries of the cops, you can request what they call a ride along. Uh, so this is a TV ride along. basically. So it's a yeah. TV ride along. So can what, you request a ride? Yes. I did yes. not know that. So, so, uh, uh, what the Fox producers thought, because Fox, it was just starting. They had no money. They go, guys, check this out. <laughs> we can request a ride along and film it for free. <laughs> no. So, so all those were ride alongs. Yes. When it first started. And, and it, the first season two, they, they tried to do a little more like they would follow the person after they were arrested through process, like try to Who be cares? more. They were like, forget yeah. this. We don't That's this. like everyone. Let's make the a narrative yep. arc. Fuck that. Yep. Kick in the door. Shout yep. shooting. Yeah, that's what you want. <laughs> and my favorite thing about cops, which I do have difficulty watching. I watched it for years, yeah. but now I kind of feel bad for everyone. Yeah, me too. Um, is the number one excuse people make when they get arrested and found with something is these aren't my pants. Yes. Which and I I'm love. Like, I've never put someone else's pants on except, on purpose or by accident. Except this might be culturally inappropriate, but a lot of the gentlemen being arrested in cops had ill fitting pants in True. that they were hanging around their knees. True. So maybe it's possible, but yeah, look, what I love is like, okay, these are my pants, but I have no idea how that bag of heroin got in there. Right. Right. Yeah, it's you, my grandma. It's yeah. These whose pants are these? They did a, a series of cops in the UK. Yeah, that's right. And it's so, I it's quote, so lame. It's very lame. And I yeah. quote this guy in one episode and my wife who's English, like yeah. always gets mad because she feels bad for this guy. Yeah. But this guy, it's, it's somewhere up North and they go in and the, he was selling drugs or something. And the guy's so sad and he's sitting on his, his couch and he goes, well, I'm living here like a dickhead. Yeah, yeah. And, then she, and then she's like but i know what he means i feel bad for him and I'm like, i tell you there's an even worse one the worst one i've seen is new zealand cops uh where literally i mean you think you know the joke is americans are kicking people in and shooting and british cops are making them cups of tea in new zealand i mean these cops are like apologizing to the people and i mean it's it's like a sort of community service show it's amazing it's fascinating and the yeah. The little glimpse of the time capsule nature of cops is pretty great. Too, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to see Boston in 1988, you, you see, know, you can go is, watch it. I agree with you on that. And we're talking about the wire. It's that kind of feel actually. And it's when crack is really hitting in and yeah. it's, 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 you know, now it's opioids, but then it's crack. So as a bit of social history, it's really interesting, but also as that kind of, the Rodney King thing, it's that halfway thing between, you know, we know cops were just inherently racist and corrupt. And this is the first sort of, you know, people almost watching cops and saying, well, is that good? Or, but you know, like it was interesting yeah. and thinking, well, of course we want to see the action. But it's only later you think, well, really, I it's a very odd show, but it interesting. Is. You, you watch it, you're like, that guy's kind of harsh. Like, he, or the yeah. cop escalated that quickly. Or yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And then you'd like, well, I don't know. I'm not a cop, you know, so who knows? Yeah. 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 It, it wasn't as, it couldn't be sanitized as much as a cop exactly. show could, which was interesting. So basically, yeah, normally police would let you 
film, but they would have some sort of control over the. But with that, it did feel real, mainly because you know the cameras were new. They were the sort of new first, sort of slightly dodgy cameras. So it just felt real. That yeah. language, yeah, it's kinetic. It's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine, uh, these 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 brothers, they're, they're brothers that are comedians, and their older brother is a cop in Boston. Yeah, and uh, I used to have a list of people, places, and things that weren't comedians that I knew that got TV credits before me. Yeah, uh, and he was one of them. So he was in an episode of Cops, and nice. It's he's driving, and he's like talking <laughs> to the camera. He's like, you know, this area there's a lot of kids who do a lot. And he looks, and you see him jump out of the car and close line this kid on a bike. And give him Amazing. The headlock. And I'm like, perfect. There and then come go. straight out the window and goes, sorry, yeah. as I was saying. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, this area, yeah, it's great. Uh, anything else on Saturday night? Yep. So I'm going to finish that. So I'm going to start with Cops, and then I'm going to finish, actually, with the, I think, the single greatest documentary series ever made, The World at War. Um, I mean, being British... I was sort of, there's this amazing books just come out by a guy called Sathnam Sanghera called Empire Land. And it's about how, just how influenced we still are about our loss of empire and about the fact that we had an empire. And one of the things he points out is the private schools, one of the ones I went to, you forget about it. Like my school was set up, Halebury and the East India Service College. It was set up to run India. Um, every hero in the school had killed Zulus or done stuff like that. Every Sunday night we'd watch the world, we'd watch Battle of the Bulge, like all this stuff. And so the world at war, I feel a bit bad for loving it because, you know, it's like, oh, here we go. We're looking about World War II again. But my dad fought in World War II. He was a Spitfire pilot, a pilot in the last year in the Pacific off, uh, uh, you know, and he flew against the Japanese. And what's amazing about this, I think it was made in the early 70s. They realized that a lot of the people who were in the war were dying. And so it was a way of kind of getting them all on record. Uh, and so they interviewed a vast amount of people for real recollections and not only English and Americans, they interviewed Japanese and Germans. So it's, it's kind of getting the aspect of the war that you didn't normally see. It wasn't just here we are against the evil Germans. It does give a slightly more rounded view. It's incredibly uh, detailed. You know, it starts right at the beginning moves through every area from the Japanese front to Burma to the home front. It's narrated by bloody Lawrence Olivier straight away. And it's made, I think, by Jeremy Isaacs, who was a really big sort of cultural cheese. So this is this is not a kind of cops. You know, right. this is this is a proper historical doc, uh, document trying its best in the best traditions of BBC. Uh, I don't know if it's made by the BBC, but, you know, to be unbiased not to were the winners and it's incredible it's it, it, i can watch it over and over again and of course it uses a vast amount of in, intercut with the interviews with people that were there it uses a vast amount of vintage footage but what they actually do and i only realized this recently is like you see some germans marching down a street and you'll hear clump 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 and of course the foley whoever did the sound <laughs> Because the sound is amazing and it makes it brings you right there. So I, I think it's the most astonishing documentary series ever made. Yeah, and this is this is the episode with the where they interview the Japanese people, which you know is Oh actually I didn't look which one was on that night. Yeah, so. this is War Through the Eyes of the Japanese. And one thing I always try to convey to people here in America, where World War II for us was a boom. Like it was after World War II, we were the victors and we yeah, got yeah. all the money, you know. Yeah. And in England when I lived there in the early 2000s, one of the buildings at Goldsmiths was still bombed out from World War II. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, if you go to Berlin, there are still places with shrapnel on it yeah. and stuff. I, I think by 2000, we were pretty much over it. But it took us... There's still took, vestigial pieces, yeah, yeah, yeah. at least. I mean, yeah. definitely took to the 60s. Till 1960, England was a place where we'd won the war, but we'd lost the empire. We were still on rations for like yeah. nine years. Uh, everything was terrible. We were having to bring in a lot of foreign people from the empire to fill jobs which now then gets resentment later and it's only in the 60s when you know that's what kick-started the 60s in england like all these teens thinking we've had enough of living like this you know and that's they rebelled and that's what started the whole thing it's interesting that that's the japanese one because actually that's what's so relevant to me is for most brits the war was against the germans mm -hmm. and when the germans uh, surrendered in 1945, there was a weird extra six months of the war where the Japanese war was still going on in the Pacific. And my dad, it's called the Forgotten War. My dad was out there and everyone else was at home shagging women in Trafalgar <laughs> yeah. Square. We in did peace. it! We did it! And he's like, what are you talking about? Wait for me! You know. So actually, I love the fact that it's, that it's about that because it's even more relevant to me. And my dad's 
claim to fame was he was on HMS Implacable and he was a Spitfire pilot or Seafire pilot. And he was 19. Imagine doing that. And one day a massive sign went up everyone on the, on the ship saying on no account. And it gave some coordinates, said no account, no one to fly over this bit of Japan. So you're 19. What do you do? First thing you do, you go over. He flew over six hours after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima Ooh. and he saw the cloud still, but he had no idea what it was. They yeah. didn't know what it was. And it really impacted him that. So I went as one of my books, I went, I went to Hiroshima and I really thought about him then. And, and I met someone he'd flown against. It was amazing. So that's crazy. it's an incredible book, the whole that, thing. Uh, but yeah. yeah. That's insane. Because that, again, I don't think the impact of that was felt here in the same way. And no, because you guys stuff, were never, you were never attacked. I mean, in no. a funny way, 9-11, imagine a 9-11 happening every day. Every day. Yeah. yeah. Because and not from it, a deadly virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, of course not. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but it is that thing when you're actually being hit at home. You don't give it, you know, it's like when you have wars in Iraq, if no one's bombing you at home, what do you care? Like, you yeah. know, it, it's very weird that, yeah. yeah and the, it did shape us because we were like masters of the world. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we were just wiped out, like yeah. both physically, like the town where I am here, there's Coventry next door. Coventry was firebombed to death, you know, it went. It's, it's weird to have the actual physical remnants of that or people who experience that sort of thing. And it's not do you know the there. most amazing story about Hiroshima that I loved? I walked around and I went and they have the shell of a, building almost above where the bomb was dropped that's still there you know and they have stuff like that and all that's very moving and in nagasaki there's a watch they found that stopped at the time the bomb dropped but the most amazing thing and i didn't realize i'd been going around hiroshima for three four days and i met this local who was telling me stuff and he pointed out trees that had ribbons around it every tree that survived the blast was given almost like a medal and so every tree you saw with a yellow ribbon around it meant it had survived the blast. It was incredible. It was really, that's really, so weird. Shinto. Yeah, it's very right? Shinto. So, yeah, 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 which is kind of great. Um, that's fascinating. Now I'm going to go back and rewatch The World at War. Uh, a little probably bum me yeah. out. Um, but yeah, that that sort of presented, last point on that, and we'll move on to yeah. Sunday. Sorry, I, I, I talked oh, too worry. much. Yeah. Um, was that it it presented world war ii in a way that vietnam was being presented yeah. to a degree yes it was that was brutal, a new way well i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right because vietnam was the first time that people were actually embedded and you kind of saw uh, uncut footage although actually vietnam was heavily censored still but occasionally people did get stuff back but yeah you're right but it was it's the mixture of actual footage it's the hindsight of history as well so you can see it all as a bigger thing but also it is just those, it's the way that you're seeing, they talk about a particular thing that happened and then you'll hear from a, a Japanese fighter pilot, say Pearl Harbor, you know, they talk about the Japanese pilots and then the people on the ground. It is incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And you realize that they were all scared shitless and didn't know what they were doing. Of course. Yeah. It, it's a it's a quintessential movement of it, not everyone involved on the ground is bad. Everyone's yeah. just kind of like, I don't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah. Someone told me to do this. And it, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just chaos. Yeah. It's chaos. It's chaos. Yeah. And it's actually uh, interestingly... That's what's interesting about the I'm doing a book next about conspiracy theories. And if you believe in conspiracy theories, then you 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 kind of believe in, you know, Pearl Harbor being a classic. People think that was a conspiracy theory for various reasons. But if you believe in conspiracy theories, you have to believe in an incredible level of organization and, and stuff. You know, like if you believe in the moon landing didn't happen, the amount of people that have to keep that secret. And really, I think what conspiracy theorists don't understand is just they can't handle the fact that the world is just random yeah. and complex and, and not organized you know that, that's I mean, exactly people in power they're just yeah. they're idiots they're no flying racing their pants it. and that's yeah. this is this is almost like a sound movement for me as well because yeah i i've you know especially the last few years i've been saying this where i'm like people who believe in conspiracy theories have so much faith in humanity yes that i do not have and, and yet they're assholes and they're yes. stupid and yeah. also they think you know we, we've got anti-vaxxers at the moment anti-vaccination yeah they're, they're all no offense to them but not the smartest guys no, and you're no. like let's just say bill gates did want to mine your brain info I'm telling you, you're not the one they're going to choose. No. It's like the UFOs always pick up fucking no teeth rednecks in but Arkansas. That's, but that's part of it. So these people, aside from the fact that, yes, the scariest thing on earth is chaos. And so yeah. they want to believe there's order, even if it's against them. It, a, because they can, they can, you can defeat order or someone's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. but the other thing is it makes them feel important. Exactly. And, and, and that's not a bad thing because actually often people do feel they're overlooked. They've been bypassed. And they, it, I mean, my line is conspiracy theories are the way stupid people get to feel like intellectuals. It's yeah. kind of like, it is, it, it kind of gives them, you know, when they, 
they sort of feel that they that whole anti-expert movement, which has long been an American trait, actually. Mm-hmm. I think it's a an anti-elitism thing, mm-hmm. really. It's like, oh, your books and your Harvard. Think you you're don't know than anything. Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that, you know, Trump made yeah. that into a into an art form, you know. Anyway, I could go on about this for Yeah, ages, sorry. Yeah. Let's move on to Sunday. Yeah. Uh, what do you got on so Sunday? Sunday? I was a bit disappointed in Sunday, I have to say. I went for most wanted. Because I remember watching that. I think that was America's Most Wanted. Mm-hmm. But actually thinking about it, it, I remember always being slightly disappointed in Most Wanted. It was kind of like the, the premise of it was that there is that great thing, the FBI's Most Wanted list. And if you're a criminal, you know, I kind of think if you're going to go the whole hog, you want to be number one Most Wanted sort of thing. But um, you always want interesting criminals like, I don't know, D.B. Cooper or something, the guy who jumped out of the plane. But it always ends up as something a bit dull. And then, as far as I remember, unlike cops, where you're seeing real shit, they sort of had recreations, didn't they? Yep. And no one wants to see a recre- you know, recreation. It's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to see out-of-work actors doing stuff like that. It's just not good. It is so kind I remember of being hilarious, disappointed though. By it. It's yeah, funny. I mean, yeah, it's but not supposed to be. I think Crime Watch in the UK was the well, version Well, there's of the, the joke thing. about Crime Watch that, you know, everyone... <laughs> Everyone, so Crime Watch is a place where you know they show crimes that have happened, and then they have a recreation of it and ask you to to ring in and tell people. And so the joke was always they want to, you want to do a bank job dressed in naked or dressed in pink bin liners, so that the out of work actors recreating had to wear that in the, yeah. in the thing. Yeah. Be like, I gotta but, uh, get realism. I think before cops and stuff like that, you probably thought this was quite exciting. This is like the yeah. FBI files, but the moment you've seen something like cops. You can't watch recreations anymore. No. I want to see CCTV footage. I want real shit. Yeah. And this was a weird story too, because the, the, the host of it here, John Walsh, his son was kidnapped and murdered. And it no. was a big story in the, in the uh, late seventies, early eighties. And okay. this guy, basically Charles Bronson, the killers, Did like he, he, he what, the like, presenter. Yeah. He went out on his own and was like, fuck this. So he had this reputation of like, I'm getting it done. So this was he- before. He did most wanted. This is why he did most wanted. But so did they, he kill them legally? Was he a cop? He wasn't a cop. He was well, like, yeah. See, in England, you'd go to prison for yes. that. Yes. Yeah, isn't it? And so very American, they were yeah. like, who should we have present the FBI's most yeah. wanted? You remember so, that vigilante yeah. serial killer? He'd be good. <laughs> Some guy who's like, the cops fucked up. I'm yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, but it was the whole like, you can help kind of thing, yeah. which is really weird. Um, yeah, but not a show that is that fun to oh, watch. Oh, I love but I love that. That's a yeah. great story. So that was worth choosing. And then my second, well, second choice is Simpsons because it just, I found it astonishing. I just forgot that in 1990, I'd, still, I'd, I'd be already be watching The Simpsons. I mean, how long has that show gone on for? You know, 31, 32 years. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what am I going to say about The Simpsons? Nothing. Yeah. It's there, yeah. but incredible that it's gone that far. And then the third one, I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is for me. This ticks all my boxes. The Kennedys of Massachusetts, you know, I'm obsessed with the Kennedy story anyway. I love the whole Camelot thing. Uh, I kind of fascinated Chappaquiddick, Kenny Bunkport, all the stuff in your area. You know, you're in Boston. I thought this is perfect. And then, no, it was some terrible made-for-TV docudrama, mm-hmm. and I knew instantly it was going to be a bomb. But I don't know. Was it? It must have been. It did well. It's yeah. silly. Uh, yeah. You know, and it's funny because I've had uh, Stephen Weber on who played JFK in this. It was like oh, one okay. of the first things he did. Um, and he's even like, it was just, it's a sweet, sweet stunt, yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because you, you know, the moment you say Kennedy's, I, like me, I go, oh, I'm going to watch that. Everybody's going to tune in, yeah. Have you ever heard the the tape of JFK losing his shit on that guy? No. So, oh, you, you look it up. It's online everywhere now. But what happened is, he was having like a war with the Congress about funding the military yeah. and some, some magazine like people magazine or something did yeah. a big photo shoot with Jackie O with all this new furniture she bought. Yes. That's so, right. So he lost his mind saying like how bad it looked that they spent this money. Yeah. So he called up like the chief of staff and it's recorded and he's like, what the fuck? This is a fuck up. And he's like losing yeah, his yeah. shit. <laughs> Suddenly goes, all his, his kind of oh, iron sophistication yes. goes, I'm going to listen to that. I wouldn't put him in charge of a fucking cat house. <laughs> <laughs> just like the funniest thing. <laughs> and then my favorite part, he's so mad he's been swearing and he goes, he's, he's, he's a silly man. Yeah, that's all. Oh, <laughs> oh, did I go too far? Yeah. I got a whole, I got to oh, reel this yeah. back in. Uh, all good choices. I, that night I would have, and I know I did in fact watch the death of the incredible Hulk. <laughs> uh, now was, is that the original Hulk? Mm-hmm, you Bill see, Bixby. I did love, you see, I hate 
I really hate superhero movies. I hate the whole, sorry, the Marvel thing. I've never seen Star Wars, not in a sci-fi. But as a kid in Lebanon, I did watch Incredible Hulk. And that was, it never made sense to me at all. But I did love it. So yeah, I probably would have watched that. This was the finale. It was like a TV movie six years after the uh, last one. And he actually dies. It was supposed to right. tie everything up. Uh, the other thing, and, and if people are playing TV Guidance Counselor Bingo, I mention this all the time. So you get a square here. Uh, somebody watched every episode of the original Incredible Hulk series yeah. and made a list of everything that causes him to Hulk out. Oh, that's it's, nice. It's not editorialized. It's just a factual list. And it's yeah, yeah. the funniest thing I've ever read because it's that's literally amazing. like tomatoes cr- crushed under a boulder. <laughs> Doesn't have money for a payphone thrown <laughs> off a bridge. Like it's just this. Yeah. And it's, it's all crazy. frankly quite justifiable. Yeah. I would be angry for at least 80% of those. Uh, Monday, what'd you do? So Monday, I was very disappointed by Sunday and the telly and I was sad, but then I saw the fourth protocol was on and I like that movie. Now I think this is the movie I'm thinking of because I don't do any research, but I seem to remember this is Ben Affleck, isn't it? The fourth protocol. No, this is from oh. 1987. It's a British movie. Then, but it's about a nuclear bomb, isn't it? Michael Caine, Ned Beatty, uh, Who Joanna Cassidy, it? who's been on the show. Um, this is Frederick Forsyth. It is. Sorry. So I got completely confused, but it is exactly the one I'm thinking of. It's great. So the fourth protocol. So I think this is one where they're smuggling a nuclear weapon. Uh, basically, they're going to smuggle it into an American air base in 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 east anglia which is the dullest flatland part of britain and then they're going to set it off and blame it on the americans because we let you have nuclear things and that would allow us to get rid of americans in there and yeah i loved it it was actually quite a political film you know this was looking at the cnd movement the anti-nuclear movement uh the left-wing movement who didn't want americans there and thinking well we can't kick them out but if we could somehow pretend that they were responsible for a nuclear accident, then, you know, we could kick them out. So actually, really interesting idea. And Frederick Forsyth, uh, you know, famous for writing Day of the Jackal, Dogs of War. I actually interviewed him in Trigger Happy and ran away from him in the <laughs> middle of it. But because in Trigger Happy, I used to just interview celebrities, frankly, that had had an effect on my life, that either cricket people or people I wanted to meet. And then it was quite embarrassing because I'd have to do something stupid. <laughs> but um, he was cool. And, and he used to be in British intelligence. So he was a former... MI6 guy, which is why he is very good on the details and things like Day of the Jackal and stuff. And then he became a massive multi-million selling guy. And this is a very interesting film, I think. And also a nice snapshot of late 80s, mid-80s Britain. Thatcher's underway. We're doing okay. We're becoming yuppies. But there is this very, very unelectable left-wing radical, very like Corbyn, who we've had recently, our Bernie Sanders type thing. And um, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, it was a good film. Made the same year in England as Nuns on the Run. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I rest my case. Similar film. Uh, yeah. So that's your whole night there. Would you do? No. On well, I'm also oh. I'm going to watch Alien Nation, but I wasn't sure if Alien Nation was the film or the series. I'm assuming it's the series. It's the series. Yeah. Which, Ken well, Johnson. I love that because I mean, firstly, you just got to give it to him. Alien Nation. Alien Nation. I mean, I love that. It tells you everything about it. And essentially, I don't know if you remember this, but it's essentially that a, a race of lizards or whatever. Again, we're coming back to our conspiracy yep. theory thing. Uh, there's just two types of people. There's us and there's the aliens. And they live, we live hand in hand. It's very like that very weird South African film that was made in Soweto, um, which was a fantastic film, where the robots had landed and they were kept in. But basically, the whole thing is a metaphor. Yes. An allegory for underclass or for black rights right. and stuff. Yeah. And Very it's interesting. thinly veiled. Yeah. This Very, was, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. They were a slave race in their home planet. Right. And they, right. they basically are refugees here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the series. And you had just, a, you had a good cop, bad cop, but yep. one was an alien. One wasn't. So it was the equivalent of the Mexican cop. Exactly. And the whatever. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah. My favorite thing about alien nation, which I really enjoy, but the, there's a, there's a note in there that they play as a joke, but is actually kind of chilling is all the aliens have stupid names. Okay. Because in the equivalent of Ellis Island, the people working there were basically like, fuck you, here's your name. That's amazing. So the so- alien cop is named Sam Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You see, I love those sort of things. But that is what it is, isn't it? I can't pronounce your name. You're yeah. going to be called Steve from yeah. now on. You're yeah. Sam Francisco, you fucking idiot. Like, That's it's a great like, name. It's like so mean. I'd quite like to be called Sam Francisco. Well, there's still time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but yeah, cool. I love that show. So I like Alien Nation. And it was, you know, it was basically a cop movie. You know, it was a, yeah. it was a, it was a cop drama, but it had a little bit of 
quite on the nose social commentary. But um, I thought it was really interesting, actually. Yeah, because Ken Johnson had done V before this, which was That's about right. the little yeah. aliens. Yeah. And the story he tells is he pitched it to NBC as a, as a, a fascist takeover of the US. Yeah. That was his original pitch. And they were like, mm, we don't like that. And out of his ass, he literally went, they're aliens? And they were like, do it. <laughs> you see, this, this is my favorite thing about television, because basically we all know no one knows anything. And how many times have I been into a pitch with something and I start and I'm, you know, you have to be a psychiatrist. Like you're, you're just watching them and you go. So the idea is we're going to have a Chinese army. And they go, ah, oh, we hate Chinese. I go, no, no, no. The whole point is we're not going to have a Chinese army. You know? And and just your whole pitch is just meandering yeah. around what they say. It's great. So and when you get out great. of there, you don't know what you agreed to. <laughs> no, but, and then you finally get something agreed that you have no interest in making or any any skill in doing but, yeah you know, that's my no job that's my life that's america yeah uh, that's that's the biz uh tuesday what'd you do so tuesday wonder years i loved wonder years now something just happened with wonder years i think it was you know one of those things that pops up on facebook and says uh you know want to feel old this is the kid from wonder years now and i think i saw him and he's He's probably my age. I Fred think, Savage is, yeah, he's in his mid forties. The yeah. So I think I know what you're talking about. They basically said, if the wonder years was made now, yeah, it would be set in 2001. Yeah. Which is crazy. It was 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's and, insane. So I don't know about wonder years. Firstly, wonder years is interesting to me because weirdly Fred Savage was the spitting image of me as a child. I could see and that. We really were almost identical. My mom used to say you're on the telly. Um, uh, and I kind of, I don't know why I liked it. I'm hoping, in fact, now I know you got this encyclopedic knowledge. I think you're going to help me out. But I just remember it was a very knowing, I mean, there were a lot of those sort of films, the sort of diary films, you know, the sort of talking to yourself about, you know, smart kid trying to analyze himself. I don't know why it was particularly unique. Why do I, why did I like Wonder Years? You it was me. a great show. It was, it was one of the first sitcoms here that was shot on film, single camera, like a movie. Yes, that's right. It and did look good. Didn't no it? laugh track. And it meant what it did was very well is it managed to tell a story that felt contemporary, even though it was all flashbacks with the family yeah. and the kids, Yeah, but appealed to that, those boomers with the nostalgia piece. It and had a real white picket fence feel. Absolutely. It? Yeah. It yeah. took place just outside Detroit, but there were a lot of characters that rung really true. Like the dad who was just angry all the time. And, and it was like, they were kind of afraid of him, but it wasn't that overly dramatic. Like he abuses them. Yeah. It was like that seething rage of a post-war dad. You yeah. saw it from the kid's point of view. The yep. kids didn't understand where he's angry. Right. Whereas now you'd be told, you know, he's on opioids. He's done all this. You right. never, it didn't matter. It was just dads were angry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, and it was just very well done. And the finale of that show is one of the saddest, most moving finales I've ever seen. I hate seen. sad though. I can't do Oh, sad. it, it bru it's brutal. So like the finale, they, uh, they all have them at this, um, 4th of July parade yeah. and it's slow motion. And in the narration, he kind of tells you where everybody ended up. Oh no. And he never got with Winnie Cooper, which you're like, all right, fine. Yeah, yeah. And then he gets to the dad and it's like, uh, you know, I have a son now named whatever. And my dad never saw him. He died of a heart attack, like three days after like, kind of the, like, Oh, oh my no. God, Jesus Christ. Yeah. But I kind of love, they do that. I yeah. hate happy endings in that. I like that they had the, the balls to do that. Well, the that's very, life. Yeah, absolutely. And the very first episode of that show hinged on Winnie Cooper's brother being killed in Vietnam. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. the pilot. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, but that's what gave it, you know, because you remember it and you think, oh, it's the wimpy kid, you know, but it's not. It, it had real depth. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It, it was great. And part of it was setting it in that time, as we were talking yeah. about before, which was a big change year uh, from the way that things were sort of portrayed. <laughs> I'm very glad that you described, you told me why I liked it. Cause I knew I liked it, but I couldn't remember why. It's great. I highly recommend revisiting it. If you're, if you're looking, it's, it's, it, it really is good. And it, it, what other shows we have now that do that kind of thing, like the Goldbergs and that sort of stuff, yeah. they're not snarky, but they have a, um, sort of an artificial they're more, view. They're sort of, they're a bit meta. I yes. Think. Yeah. Too, they're kind of too much. They're too pleased with themselves. There was a glorious innocence there was actually, you kind of felt, yeah, that was how I felt yeah. if I grew up outside Detroit. Yeah, it had a sincerity. Kind of, yeah, it was, yeah, it was real. You're uh, going to hate yeah. me for my next choice, but it is no. a film. And I'm choosing it, and I don't think I liked it. I probably fancied her because those are the days. Lady in Red. Um, you know, it's Krista Berg, who I hate. But yeah, actually, I do quite like a couple of songs, but I feel I should hate him. 
lady in red. The girl was stunning. I can't remember. She Kelly went out. Brock. Yeah, that's right. And she went out with at least one of Guns N' Roses, I think, or one of those. Steven White Seagal. Snake. No. <laughs> Yeah, you're thinking That's of Tawny. Terrible. Tawny Katane went out with I'm David Coverdale. I'm thinking Tawny Katane. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my she's God. She's a redhead. Steven Seagal. So she's mental. Oh, God. Well, she yeah. married him. Oh, and I, I've talked to her since. She she was in Weird Science. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, God. I she, loved her. She's, she's great. Uh, yeah. But she had a rough time. And so Steven Seagal's a real piece of shit. Yeah, of course. And like, he had a daughter with her. Totally ignores them. He had a daughter with a Japanese woman before that. Yeah. Totally doesn't acknowledge her existence, but she's like a huge TV presenter in Japan these days. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's a piece of shit. Of course. Uh, but, yeah. that's, but he has to live in Russia now, so that's cool. Yeah, he does. So and he, he cares, ruined yeah. her career. Yeah, ruined yeah. it. Because when they uh, broke up- he, I don't want to talk about him anymore. I can't yeah, it was, but, but this uh, movie is is basically a ripoff of 10. Yes. But what I find interesting about this movie, I suppose, is that because this is 1990, even though this wasn't made, this is the last gasp of that kind of movie, the kind of the Ferrari, the hot girl, the Randy teenagers, you know, the kind of thing we grew up with from Risky Business, the kind of lose our virginity type film, the Brat Pack end. And that did disappear for a bit. We all went a bit more, we kind of better, actually sort of a bit more poetic. And then of course they all came back, you know, like right. in a even shitter way. I mean, at least these were well-made films sort of thing. So I prefer to watch this than I would, you know, a superhero movie, put it yeah. that way. No, it's got a more interesting character base here. My favorite thing about this is, so this is on our local Fox affiliate. This is a Boston edition. Mm -hmm. And they would do theme weeks of movies. Right. And this week is one red of the weird, or better, ladies. better red than dead week. Oh, okay. So an anti-communist week. Which yeah. is an anti-communist phrase, Yeah, but they're just showing movies with red in the title. Oh, that was it. Yeah, they hadn't even understood it. Okay. So, like, uh, the man with one red shoe is on later in the week. Like, okay. it's just like, so that's that. why we got women in red. Well, that's why, unfortunately, one of the most powerful people in television that you never meet is the scheduler. And that's, thank God, those fuckers have gone, because... I've been scheduled in such bad places and you can't argue with a scheduler. Do you know yeah. I mean? They're like trigger happy TV. Yeah. Trigger uh, happy TV. The put squirrels. The, I'll the put gun, that on the four gun, in the afternoon. The gun yeah. show. <laughs> well, I prefer the gun show. Yeah. Yeah, they go, Hmm, that's a squirrel. I'll put it on four in the afternoon. <laughs> Kids love that. Yeah. Uh, so you're watching that all night. How about Wednesday? So Wednesday, I like Wednesday. Moonlighting. God, I loved moonlighting. So you've got Sybil Shepherd in the soft focus already. Uh, the classic, you know, the Bruce Willis is, you know, discovery. He's come from a barman, I think in Boston, wasn't he? Uh, he was, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was a barman and he just has that kind of, he just doesn't look like your normal TV handsome guy, but he's just got it. Like, you know, he's got that thing and it's the, it's the classic will they, won't they, which you want to know. It's the perfect scenario, which is great, but it, it had, it just, it was almost a pastiche, wasn't it? It was a spoof of detective. It was very knowing but without, it just felt like a really smart show that had all the good things about a good detective, will they, won't they stuff. But also it just felt a bit, it, it, it was postmodern is yeah. how I would describe it. I loved it. Yeah, it was one of the shows where it was that the first generation of people who grew up watching TV started making TV. And it was people that respected TV, I think, mm -hmm. rather than thinking TV was beneath them. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what I think has been the big difference now. And yeah. it was, it was, I mean, that show, I don't know how much of it carried over to the UK, but that was one of the first big shows where there was so much drama behind the scenes. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they literally sometimes would have an episode scheduled and it wouldn't be done in time and they'd have to shoot something to be like, it's not a new one this week. Here's a repeat. I love that. <laughs> and though. they would sort of incorporate it in. Yeah. But Sybil Shepard was sort of a movie star on her way down or mm -hmm. before her second career. And obviously Bruce Willis was on the way up. Yeah. And the, it worked. And when they met, when it was met, Moida. Uh, which <laughs> They actually had that guy uh, cameo as that character in one episode. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and Pier go. Pierce Brosnan was in an episode as Remington Steele. Like they yeah, kind yeah. of acknowledged all these things. Yeah. But when they were on the same level, when she was going up and he was going down, it worked perfectly. But, but then once he. It's like an open marriage. It's never going to stay. Oh, balanced, you're yeah. never going to be able. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just an insufferable piece of shit. He was. <laughs> yes. Oh, it was him, was it? Oh, he's one of. Well, she was. So uh, Ed Curtis Armstrong. She was vulnerable, yeah. She, she, who played um he's in revenge of the nerds and he yeah yeah, yeah. he was on the show and curtis is the best guy and uh favorite shows the avengers but um he first day on set he's never met anyone he's walking to the set and he runs into civil shepherd yeah and he's like you know hey thank you for having me on the show like i, lo I love your work i saw the episode last night it's great and she goes you better stop 
stop uh, complimenting me. Or we're going to have a problem. <laughs> so he starts laughing because like, that sounds like a joke. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, so he says another compliment. She bursts into tears, runs into her trailer, locks the door. Shooting is done for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Though. So he's like, okay. <laughs> but but those are the days when, you know, just shit happened. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it'd be a nightmare to be on it, but I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that's your Wednesday. That's not just my Wednesday. I've followed it up by Larry King live. So Larry King obviously is not alive anymore, sadly. Oh. Uh, but I always was obsessed with Larry King. I loved that he could pretty much go from highbrow to lowbrow. I love, so. I mean, I feel I'm like that. I can do highbrow in watching and I can go lowbrow. And, you know, one minute you'd have OJ. Next minute he's interviewing the prime minister of Nepal. You know, I yeah. don't know. Like, it, it was fantastic. He's got Bono on like that. It's great. And my my abiding memory of Larry King actually is the Seinfeld thing when Seinfeld comes on and Seinfeld just takes him apart because yeah. you know Larry King's like and you were he goes do you think I was cancelled Larry that yeah. was the biggest show can someone get Larry I just love that and Larry got a bit uppity but um I, I just I loved Larry King life it was interesting have you ever seen the Marlon Brando Larry King episode yes I have yes oh yes, yes. that's maybe the best hour of television in yeah, the yeah, world. yeah 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 tell Marlon, us about it Marlon Brando is insane he's yeah, on yeah, his yeah. private island <laughs> yeah and and and, and Larry King just wants this interview. So he's going along with anything. Yeah. And at one point, Marlon Brando goes, come on, Larry, sing a song with me, Larry. And he's, <laughs> and he's like, all right, Marlon. All right, Marlon. Marlon. Yeah. And Larry, and Marlon Brando starts playing a loaf of bread. <laughs> and he goes, all right, Larry, let's play the bread. Okay, Marlon. And then he kisses Larry on the mouth. And like oh. they're singing. It's just crazy. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It, to me, it reminds me of when we've been, when I've been in a situation with real ass kisses and Sam and I have Trigger, we used to do it occasionally. Just think, look, in fact, often it happened when we went to LA and we'd be in meetings and we're like, absolutely. Because, you, you know, one of the rules I learned very quickly is everyone says yes in LA in a meeting. Of course, it doesn't mean anything, nope. but they will never say no. So we would just, we'd get into a situation where we'd be like, is there any way we can get them to say no to things? And we would just pitch the most ridiculous things. Never, never got a yeah. no. They were like, hey, we love that guy. Yeah. We could make that happen. We could make that happen. Yeah. Why don't you fuck off? Sorry. I didn't say that. <laughs> we'll play the bread. We'll play yeah. the bread. Yeah, I like it. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. Also that night, there's a made for TV movie on called Nightlife that I actually enjoyed. And it stars Ben Cross of Chariots of Fire. Okay. Uh, and Miriam Dabo of uh, oh, yeah. Living Bond Daylights. Film. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of this weird before it's time sort of cool vampire movie that everybody hated at the time but i, I think it's it. probably yeah, good right. <laughs> isn't that weird miriam darbo was in living daylights and i have my next door neighbor uh who i met recently started chatting turns out to have been miss money penny in the two <laughs> timothy dalton uh bond films how cool is that <laughs> that's really cool she's that's called amazing. caroline bliss and uh it was very cool so yeah so I was, I, i've got a bit of bond next to me and marion's cousin olivia darbo yeah. who's a friend was the older sister on the wonder years you see, this is all coming yep. together perfectly yep. and it coming together for me on Thursday because Thursday is probably, so I know this is 1990, but this is definitely my favorite film of the eighties and it's Heather's. I loved Heather's. Now Heather's has everything to me. I mean, I really loved Christian Slater. Um, I loved the high school movie, but this was a meta piss take of a high school movie, but it, but it was more than that. It was, Sometimes there's a film called Picnic Hanging Rock, which is like the weirdest film. Peter Weir. Peter Weir. There are almost elements of that. It's a very dark, weird, satirical sort of... It's like that weird moment I'm talking about when neuromanticism is over and grunge is arriving and no one really knows what's happening or how to feel, and it's the 80s. And Heathers encapsulates all that, and it's got... Um, Winona Ryder, who's yep. fantastic in it. But most importantly of all, this film taught me about the existence and led me to go and do cow tipping. I'd never <laughs> cow tipped before. And I watched Heather's and we all got very drunk uh, with my happy hour friend, uh, Pete, in his farm in Devon. And I said, we're going cow tipping. And they said, what's that? I go, just trust me. And in the film, the cows fall asleep standing up and you sneak up to them. The reality is there's a cow. You don't know if he's asleep or not. It's midnight. You're pissed. You go up to the cow, you're about to push, and he just looks at you and goes, what are you doing? So I've never tipped a cow, <laughs> but I've tried. And I love cow tipping as a concept. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, Heather's is sort of everything. I, I love is, that movie it? so much. I'll have to Heather's is like, Heather's got all the shallowness of the 80s, but it's also almost looking back, it's almost already aware how weird the 80s were. It's an incredible yeah. film. And it manages to be cynical and um, 
sort of meta, but without feeling shallow, which is really hard to pull off. It's a smart uh, movie. It's, it's very like a smart Mean movie. Girls thing, but it's, I think, better than Mean yeah. Girls. Way better, yeah. I uh, When I was in LA, I, I usually go out a couple times a year. A couple times ago, I went to the high school from Heather's where they no, shot it. And I'd so love to know that, yeah. I have a picture of me standing on the staircase where they come down after the bomb, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I got, I got it, you know? So it's just, so it looks exactly the same, which is pretty Because amazing. there were two, you know, the Christian Slater thing, because he then, I think after Heather's, made that amazing film where he's a DJ. Pump up home, the volume. Which I love. Yes. I mean, again, it was dark. And so Christian Slater was the kind of the dark side of the American high school experience, you know, but not to Columbine levels, although right. in Heathers, although in Heathers, it well, does yeah. get pretty, yeah. yeah. But it, I thought it was amazing. I love those. There's two movies I'll recommend to you that you may not have heard of. One is called Massacre at Central High, Ooh. which is a 70s exploitation movie, but was a big influence on Heathers. It, it, it doesn't have... It's very interesting if you're a big Heathers fan. Yeah. And the second one is the follow-up to Heathers that they made, which cool. was a massive bomb, but is a fascinating movie. Cool. And it's called Meet the Apple Gates. I've seen Meet the Apple Gates. I yes. Yes. Of course it was. Yes. What a weird Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same sort of thing as Heathers, but instead of high school, it's sort of environmentalism and suburbia it's that they take Stepford on. Stepford wives type yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yeah. That's really such interesting. a great movie. Um, but I, yeah, Heather's is everything. I, I, uh, Heather's is everything. Yeah, yeah really. It's yeah. the best. And the soundtrack's great. Like yeah. I love that. Yeah, we'd have been friends in London. I know. I know. Yeah, I'm yeah. so sorry. We'd be at the sound, <laughs> we'd be at the sound gigs. Yeah. Watching Heather's. <laughs> I'd be telling, telling girls who weren't interested how great Adrian Borland was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, he'd love Adrian. Uh, he killed he's himself. But he was great. Yeah. yeah. Right there. <laughs> um, so Friday night, final night of the week. What do you got? Yeah. Well, I wish I'd finished on Heather's really. Cause Friday night, all I really found was the South Bank show. And I, I only like that because to me, that's such an English thing. I love the fact that it was seemed to be quite a regular yeah. thing in your TV guide in 1990. And the South Bank show, for people that don't know, uh, hosted by, I could be, I've got his name now. Um, who was he? A massive ponce anyway. He's a, you know, an intellectual, northern intellectual with a, 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 a ah. Name's I can't gone. think of it either. Yeah. No, but anyway, and you know, big flowing hair, like a bit of a pretentious mu movie producer type, theatrical type. And he would interview everyone. It was the, you know, now, for instance, he'd go from Eminem to the Royal, the Dutch ballet to some obscure Czech poet. And just, so it was a bit like when you watch Jules Holland later with Jules Holland, if you've ever seen it, you know, there's always a popular band there's an indie band, there's a band you like, and there's what I call a lucky dip. You know, it's sometimes world music. Often it's just unlistenable to, but just sometimes you think that is great. And so the South Bank show was like a roll, your di roll the dice moment. It was basically a very smart guy uh, telling you things that you kind of wouldn't know about. And most of the time it just made you feel a bit stupid, but sometimes you discovered something extraordinary that you hadn't before. So yeah. I like the South Bank. Show. And it's, it wasn't Tony, what's his name from factory. It wasn't Records, Tony Wilson, but it was, no. it was, it was someone like that without no, the it's, edge. It's Melvin. He, no, what's he, I'm just gonna look it up now. Um, it's just irritating. But yeah, me. to your point to where we sort of started, yeah. it's a perfect example of that show where you stumble on stuff and yes. you, you were introduced to things you wouldn't yeah. normally like you're trying but also, to, it's to that, try things. It's that thing that TV doesn't do now because it was very niche. You know, it was an intellectual show. It was a, glorification of normally high art although sometimes it would treat what it would call low art so it maybe would do something on new order or joy division but do it in a you know if you got covered by the south bank show you were an artist it was like a recognition thing and so i think it was very niche it was very all the things everyone hates now intellectual uh it was uh ivy league-ish it was quite smug sometimes but you know what i loved it i loved that these things existed. And I loved that if you were a, if you were a, you know, a Northern working class kid and stuff, and maybe you didn't want to watch the tube or stuff like that. And you watch this and you suddenly think, fuck, you know, I bet you Morrissey would watch the South Bank show. You know, it's a shame he's become a Nazi now, so we don't like him, but Morrissey would have sat there being bullied at school in Manchester and he would have watched the South Bank show and thought, that's what I want to be. You know, so I thought the South Bank show was an astonishing show. Really, really incredible. And that's what TV does at its best. And it's almost like that travel show where you have I agree. You know, like a kid growing up with no money in Boston. I can watch that stuff for it free. Makes, yeah. you know? It gives you aspirations, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think most TV now, and again, I'm just sounding my age because it's probably not true, but I do think a lot of TV now is dumbed down and it's, it's, 
I always felt telly was made, I, telly I like is made when it trusts its audience, like films or telly, when it just, it just assumes that you've got a certain level of brain and you're going to follow it. And there's just so much explanation and back referencing. And here's what you missed for the break. It's like, we fucking get it, dude. Just move yeah. on, you know? So uh, <laughs> I, I love the South Bank show just because I don't think it would ever be made now. You know, no. it, it, it would only be, there is one now called Imagine, uh, which is made by Alan Yentob, who basically runs the BBC. And that's kind of like a vanity project for him because he runs the BBC. He's allowed to make it. But he goes and interviews Eminem and Zaha Hadid and stuff. And that's great. That's him just hobnobbing. But South Bank show is better. Yeah, because it wasn't, it, it was, they were trying to program something they thought people would want to watch yeah. instead of just like, I just like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it really wasn't. And also, yeah. this was, these are the days when British TV actually had a, there was a bit of your charter that said you need to make a certain amount of stuff that frankly will not get advertisers, but right. it's good for you, you know. Right. And they would export this stuff. That was on A&E here, Amazing. which is hilarious because, uh, you know, that, does all those reality shows now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the time it was the Arts and Entertainment Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would show stuff like The Prisoner and like sort of operas and stuff yeah. like the South Bank show. But I think what's interesting about it is that in the there was always that distinction between high art, opera, theater, you know, playwright, stuff like that. And then music, you know, classical music versus indie music. I think there was a magazine in England called Modern Review, and the first thing it did was it decided to treat popular culture with the same kind of in-depth analysis that art has. And I think the South Bank show did do that. It, 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 it was a high art show, but often it would deal in popular stuff and take it seriously. Yep. And I think that was the first merging of that. I think that was really interesting. So go check out South Bank show, everybody. There's a bunch on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it I mean, really is. pretty much anyone you've ever loved that you didn't understand will be on the South Bank show. Yeah, it was like a Nick Cave episode of oh, the South Bank show. The Nick show. Cave one is great. Oh, oh we could talk amazing. Nick Cave. Yeah. Have you seen oh. Nick Cave's movies? Yes. A million Days yes. on Earth or whatever it's called, 20,000 yeah. Days on Earth. I think that's one of the greatest films I've ever seen. I loved, um, what's the prison one he wrote um, ages uh, the, um, ago? Uh, the Ass of Ghost the... Ghosts of the Civil Dead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, just The amazing. Ass of the Angel? Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. that oh, stuff's. That's, right, yeah. we're going to meet. I'm going to go to Boston. Yep. All right, we'll do it. Come on. <laughs> yeah. when, once the once COVID's over, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll hang out. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. It's been great talking to you. I was really worried that I wasn't, I hadn't done enough depth for this. But actually, <laughs> I've watched more TV than I remembered, which is good. Yeah. I love TV. It's, I mean, I owe my life to it, my career to it, and it's made me the happiest in a lot of my life, so it's great. There you go, Dom Jolly, former schoolmate of Osama bin Laden and fellow traveler in the land of sound advocacy. Uh, that was in no way planned at all. Uh, that was such one of my favorite moments in the history of the show when we both realized that the sound was our band. Um, yeah, that was so fun. I could have talked to him all day and... I hope you enjoyed that even one tenth as much as I enjoyed it, in which case you would have enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, so thanks again to Dom. Check out his Twitch channel. I'll put up links on tvguidancecounselor.com and all the social media stuff. And uh, you can go there and you'll find his stuff. You'll like it if you're not familiar with it. And if you are, you have excellent taste. Uh, speaking of social media, I'm at TV Guidance on Instagram and Twitter and at Kenneth W. Reed on the same, R-E-I-D. I uh, spell it uh, the Irish way or the black way. Depends or both. It, it depends on who you are in your view of the world uh and also if you want to email me you can do so at tvguidancecounselor gmail.com or canadaicanread.com let me know who you'd like to see on the show let me know how you're doing let me know what you're watching uh and if you're listening to the show whatever platform you're listening to if you get in touch with me let me know where you listen to it and let me know uh how you've heard about the show i'm just curious you don't have to uh you can also go on our patreon patreon.com backslash tv guidance counselor i'm working on getting more stuff up on there so let me know what you would like to see you can donate a buck a month or whatever you like uh cool if you don't too i'm totally cool with that uh i just appreciate you listening <laughs> um so anyway we're here each and every week and we'll be here again next time so i hope you will too for a brand new edition of tv guidance counselor Oh my, ben. You are fucking with me. No. This is my band. That's my, my band. band. No, that's my part, band. 